Hey everybody, welcome to our uh, monthly level up. Uh, we're talking with leaders about uh, their leadership skills and also the skills that we need to grow our careers. During today's webinar, we encourage you to use the chat feature of our WebEx, post questions, share an insight, and let others know why you're attending. Today, we're excited to chat with Jerry, Chief Communications Officer of North America and Head of Global External Communication. Thanks for joining us, Jerry. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. All right, so uh, Jerry, I was thinking about um, this conversation on my bike ride this weekend, and my intro changed like a hundred times every single time I was replaying this conversation. So I thought, okay, I, I, Mike, I'm getting nervous that you're thinking about it <laughs> while you're riding your bike. Yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> so, uh, so I thought I'd start off with the story, um, the very first time I saw you. And this was when I first joined Experian, and this was like eight and a half years ago. You weren't my boss, um, but I got invited to a meeting, and it was like you and Susie and a bunch of others. And I walked into the meeting, and for, for some reason, the person who organized the meeting wasn't there. And there was a bunch of us. There was probably like 20 of us. And we were over, over by the Malibu room, and we're all in, around this like table. And we're all there. And the person who organized it for some reason wasn't there. And I'm not even sure like why we were all there. <laughs> and and so all of a sudden you just took control. Like you just like you stood up and started to like to lead the conversation. And you said, Oh, since so and so's not here, uh, let me just share my thought. And you just like set the stage. Mm-hmm. You then organized the entire meeting. And I was sitting there going, wow, who is this person? Like, it's not even your meeting, but you like took control of it. And then when I ended up joining your team later on, um, and there's a lot of reasons why I did, uh, seeing you manage crisis and like chaos and like, you're like that calming voice that like, there's a storm happening out there and you're the captain of the ship and we're all looking to you and you're able to like make sense of like what's happening, calm people down, steer a group, even though there's all this stuff going on, all these unknown factors. And I've been kind of seeing you like do that. So I just wanted to ask you uh, about that. Uh, well, thanks for the memory. I, I can't recall that. <laughs> I could be part of aging and senility. Um, uh, like, I, I don't know if it's just over the years of being exposed to to issues or, or needing to, you know, when you're when you're in a room and you're staring down twenty people, yeah, and nobody's there to, to kind of take the lead. I, I'm ha- I'm happy to step in if I if I have a sense of, of what the agenda may be. Um, I I also think from uh, raising two boys and and being married for twenty years gives you a sense of how to how to manage through those things a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, also I think like. Um, you have that that confidence and I want to say confidence with a smile because you're not there's like a, there's like a cold confidence like a calculated con- where someone could be very very confident but could be very very cold mm-hmm. and those kind of leaders I don't I'm not really drawn to those types of leaders like they're very confident and they're great on stage and they know how to command a presence and command attention but there's also like your kind of confidence where it's like I say confidence with a smile because you're confident up there, but you're also relaxed, and you're and you also don't take yourself too seriously. Well, I think how you how how I project myself or how anybody projects themselves when they're in meetings like this will also set the tone of the meeting and the engagement with the people who are attending. Um, I think if you have a demeanor that's that's kind of either forceful or commanding, demanding in a way that can make people feel uh, put off, you're not going to get the best out of them. And when when I am managing a meeting uh, and and want to get the best out of the people, you, you got to f- figure out how do you how do you get them to feel comfortable mm. in that meeting to speak up. Um, be, because like so, some sometimes people don't want to raise their hand and speak up because there's such a loud voice by whoever's mm-hmm. leading the meeting. So it's a balance of saying, hey, it, this is my agenda or this is our agenda and what we're going to do. And hey, my K-Paddy, what do you guys think? Uh, 
and, and by the way, if I'm speaking at a, a group for an hour yeah. or 45 minutes, then they'll be bored. Number one. <laughs> uh, and, and number two, uh, the reason I think so much of our team and really the, the people of experience, uh, I, I learned from those people and you guys all the time. And so I want to hear different voices. And so you want to create an environment in a meeting where you get more voices and you get more opinions. And I think that's an important, especially for this group to think of is always have a voice and have a take and, and, and share your opinion. And it might not always be right, but you've got an opinion and then you, you kind of put it all together to assess what's the right approach. Um, so, so, so don't be afraid. So I think for the way I manage, I try and encourage uh, engagement from people. What would be, I guess, your advice to leaders who um, they're, you know, they're leading a team. Maybe they're in a big, you know, brainstorming session with their team, and they're just some, you know, for whatever reason, more quiet people in the room who have a perspective, but it's a little bit hard. You know, maybe they don't feel confident sharing their, their perspective. What would be your advice to that leader to kind of draw out the best out of the people in the room? Well, um, I, I think there's so many great leaders out there and they all have their kind of own approach. So I'll just tell you kind of my my approach on something like that. Um, and, and, it, and it comes down to a bit of psychology and understanding um, the, the mindset of the person, like if I see somebody over in, in the corner that eh, they probably want to speak up or not. And so I may look over and say, hey, Mike, you know, I know you've got this experience. What do you think about that? Mm. And again, it goes back to the comfort. And, and, you know, there's different management philosophies. Some say, hey, we want people to be uncomfortable. Right? <laughs> So, I mean, right, meaning right, like, hey, right. don't ever get comfortable because you want to yeah. challenge yourself yeah, yeah, and right, you want it right. to hit your ex. Right, right, you better right. be uncomfortable as soon as you get too right. comfortable. Now, that is factual for performance. Right. But for engagement, you want to get in an environment where you can go over and say, yeah, okay, hey, Patty, what about that? And, and what do you think? And it might be a bit uncomfortable right away. But yeah. once somebody speaks up and it's like, hey, good thought, or, you know, let's just build on it. And and I know we're not talking about brainstorming, but it also goes to the to the sense that when we're talking about things, I, I do not like when people are throwing out, if somebody throws out an idea, yeah. and somebody else says, no, no, that'll never work. Well, it may not, but as soon as you go with that and say that, that person will just go back to the mm. corner. So how do you foster the environment where you get people to think more and encourage it? And you know, for for every five or ten ideas that I throw out, four, five, six may be okay. Uh, four may not be too good, but we we're still throwing out the ideas. Yeah. So for those of you listening, um, just so you know, Jerry actually is our boss. Oh, yeah. so, um, <laughs> yeah, full transparency. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Jerry, actually, you were uh, my second interview when I was about to be hired on at Experian. And I remember being told by the recruiter after I first interviewed with Mike, oh, like you're going to be interviewing with the chief communications officer next. I was like, oh, really? <laughs> because at my at all my previous jobs, um, it was really rare for us to have open communication with our leaders. Um, so in my previous job, I never even met the owners of like the company that I worked for or anything, let alone like a C-suite executive. So going into our interview, I was actually super nervous. Mm-hmm like more nervous than a normal interview, but then you ended up being really cool, very approachable, um, just like very, it was a very conversational um, atmosphere. So I want to know a little more about leadership styles that you learned from. I know you say you learn from the team that you manage and all of that, but I kind of want to know about the leadership styles that you maybe saw and wanted to avoid, or maybe styles that you saw and wanted to mimic, because I feel like the atmosphere that we work in, it's very open, it's very welcoming, and everyone is kind of encouraged to participate, like you mentioned. Yeah, I, I, I'm always surprised when I hear of hierarchical environments where people at you know either junior or mid-level don't have access to or can't have conversations 
with our either C-suite executives or senior executives. Yeah. And, and I think that's a big plus at Experian is we have that sort of culture where everybody everybody is kind of sharing and open and we know about Craig Boundy's um, meetings with, with employees, all employees, so that's good. Um, it, like I don't, I don't want to cite any one particular <laughs> manager or leader I've had in my 25 plus years, um, but you definitely, uh, I, I've definitely had leaders who have been standoffish and not right. open, and what what I've, uh, and then I've had leaders who are saying, "Hey Jerry, come on in. I want to hear your mm. idea," and or what what do you think about this? And it's those sort of leaders that I try and emulate and and by the way we have some leaders like that here yeah and and it I I, I realize I can get more or, and I got more out of the um, and my boss got more out of the environment where it was more open and so you could have that kind of relationship mm. you know Patty going back to you coming in for the interview we're we're a modestly small team, anyways, and and I I doesn't matter who the person is on the team. We're all one team, and right. and I want to be able to have that con- conversation with every single person on the team. So it, it does matter. I'm glad I'm glad that worked out, and we're glad yeah. you're here. <laughs> we're glad you accepted, and I'm glad I didn't scare you. Away, no, my, didn't my, mine may say differently. <laughs> no. Um, but going back to you saying how like there's you know those kinds of leaders where they want it like hierarchical and they don't want you to talk to them and yeah. they don't want it to be as open and there's going to be leaders like that at every company. How do you kind of deal with working with those kinds of people? Both I guess as when they're your manager and as yeah. like peers. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you, you have to be what I what I would advise for any any person coming through the ranks is you have to also be flexible to the work environment and and the leadership because you're not always going to pick the perfect leader and you're not always going to get that perfect mm-hmm. leader um, and um, I, I've had those before and you just kind of understand what what drives them and, and by the way that leader whether you agree with their style or not they want to succeed yeah they want the company, the client, whoever, to succeed. And they do want you. They do want the employees to succeed. So how? So if I were in that environment where I didn't necessarily agree with their approach, I would still say, well, how can I bring value to their decision-making or how can I help them out? And um, Because as soon as I help them succeed at something, then they may be a little more approachable for for working with me um, so you just understand I think it, it's understanding their motivations too mm-hmm. what what's going to make them feel like they're successful yeah yeah I think that speaks to um, another quality that you have Jerry which is and I wrote this down on my my phone um, not while you were biking not, 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 not while I was biking <laughs> Not while I was biking, but afterwards. Does everybody who listens to this understand your biking story? <laughs> right, a whole, whole episode okay. about about falling down on bikes and the dangers. Um, but one of the, one of the things I was, I was thinking about, what are the things that some of the qualities about Jerry that I really admire? And um, one of them was I put down that you are a very empowering leader. Like some people, some leaders, and I've had these leaders in the past can be very, very domineering with their power um, and making you feel, sometimes I felt in some some cases, worthless. Um, I've had some really... Was that, I've that had wasn't some, here, right? That wasn't I here. That wasn't sure. here. But I've had, I've had some very bad leaders in my experience um, that were very domineering, very fear-based. And I was feeling threatened all the time. I felt like very unsafe for a lot of different reasons. And um, and then when I met you and ended up working on your team, your style I felt was very uh, empowering, like very collaborative. Like you were like, come on in, share your ideas. What can we do? Um, can you talk a little about your, like that empowerment style? Um, 
many people have said this over the years, but you always want to surround yourself with uh, smarter people than yourself. You want people who have different views and different uh, takes, um, and uh, I, I kind of cherish that, I embrace that, and I don't have the answers for everything. I've got a general approach and strategy and where we want to go and our ambition of, of how we want to be perceived and, and maybe how we operate. But, you know, citing just social media as an example, do I know generally the, how, to, how to approach it or what to think about it and how it's going to move our brand or our reputation and how to manage? Yeah. But who are the experts? You are Mike, you are Patty, Sarah, every, those are the people. And if, if I try and make those decisions on yeah. my own or if I, if I do that on my own, we won't be as successful as having multiple points of view and coming in and, and then saying, this is the right way to go. Um, and, um, and, and I think we're more successful because of that. And so, you know, it all goes back to what, what drives success. That, in my opinion, will drive more success than trying to say, this is plan X and this is what we're going to do, go do it. Because then you're also not motivating the yeah. the employees. You're not motivating the people. Because don't you feel better when you collaborate on it and you go in and say, hey, I, I'm part owner of this. I helped come up with this program. And I'm going to feel very passionate about uh, achieving it. Yeah, and, and I love also, for those that know, don't know, Jerry, so when you do brainstorm with Jerry or in a meeting, all of a sudden Jerry goes to the whiteboard. And at that point, I know something good's happening because <laughs> Jerry goes to the whiteboard and begins to write down these ideas that are like, and and then you kind of make like a map, and that map will stay on the whiteboard until it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very uncomfortable when I don't have my dry erase marker. To the whiteboard. <laughs> there you go. Um, and but it, because we as we're talking, yeah. oh, great idea. Let's put it down. Otherwise, you're just talking and, and, okay, walk away. But if you put it down, it becomes more tangible. Mm -hmm. And then and then you can refer to it. And then as, uh, you know, as the example goes and you're in there, you'll snap a photo of yeah. it and say, all right, this is where we're going to go. Yeah. Well, you're really good at, like, also organizing the stuff. I'm not good with that. You remember. You j you jot down in your, your notebook online. You're being too nice. <laughs> right now, he's got, now, he's now. Got, you've got tons of notes. Everything you can go back and see things very very fast. I, I do I do I do um, I will say um, that maybe this is just my my crutch is taking notes and how you when you have thought like you you gave the example when you're on your bike ride and, yeah. you're, and you go over and use your phone to take a note. I could be over and you hear people having notepads by their bedside to take, I don't go that far. <laughs> but I, I do keep various programs, whether it's Evernote uh, or now OneNote, um, and and on my board is, I, I may have ideas all the time, and I jot it down, or I may hear something, or I'll see a news story, and I capture it because, and I, and I think that's a good takeaway for this sort of discussion is, It'd be be a sponge for all sorts of information and ideas, and, and you're going to get that either through an environment, or I may be at <clears throat> at the beach or a lake, and I hear something that somebody says and say, oh, that's kind of inspiring. Let me write that down and see what that means. Or I may watch uh, CNBC and see a news story that says that we should do something, or there's all sorts of uh, matter and inputs, and make sure you capture that. Because otherwise, it could be a fleeting thought. Yeah. At least for me, I need to. You, I need. I need to write it down, and then say, what does that mean, and how can that contribute to, to our strategy? And it might be a nugget of an idea, but it could be the next idea. I think part of it's also like a skill, because I will jot down notes, but I have like a long running online document that's just like random notes of like all these oh, different no. ideas. But you you do a very good job of like. <laughs> 
putting things into folders, and I think I'm glad you mentioned Evernote and OneNote. I love Evernote because you you can you you're able to quickly find the stuff. So I think that's a really good skill that I I need to work on, like being able to organize. organize. How do you, how do you organize your things, Patty? Evernote. Evernote. Yeah, I have like my Evernote. folders, and then like each each document is a different note thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't do the whole one long document. That would drive me crazy. Yeah, that's me. That's, me. <laughs> that's my disheveled crazy mind. Um, well, with Evernote and all your note taking and all your ideas, I feel like when I do it, I kind of get lost in my ideas and there's just so many things. And I know that with your position, you're also having to pay attention to the news a lot. Mm-hmm. So even just with your notes or the news, like how do you cut through the noise and like focus on something that's like actually really important? Uh, uh, super hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I have a great answer for it because there's a lot of noise. There's right. a lot of noise in the media there's a lot of different ideas there's a lot of noise and you're in north america and and in north america yeah paying attention that um you know the big uh the big push as you guys well know right now is it's high performance and our ambition and and getting a clear focus on what we need to work on so as we as we set our dominant goal, that that becomes the centerpiece. And so as I'm taking information or, or giving consideration, can it impact our dominant goal that is to improve the reputation and to, to become, let's say, the world's most admired company, whatever it may be, you know, can is what I'm taking in helping that yeah. or not? Uh, and that that's on a business side, right. of course. But I, you know, I I read everything and take in things that can also contribute to my personal side as well. I mean, business is important, and it is. But also, either raising my family and of course, kids yeah. and stuff, or also I, I I pull in a lot of different pieces of information and and. Such. Uh, Jerry's like a computer. Like I'll sit there chatting with him, and then Jerry always has Bloomberg on uh, on the screen there. And I was chatting with, with Jerry, and all of a sudden, like, something comes up, and Jerry's, like, taking a picture while he's chatting with me. And I'm like, <laughs> and then Jerry's like, oh, Jerry tells me what he's doing. But you, like, you're like you're a sponge for information, because you'll see stuff, and you'll just keep it in the back of your head, like, oh, that, you know, our competitor is doing this, so I need, need to remember that. Yeah. It's, um, well, it, it goes to documenting mm-hmm. and, and noting what, what what I see, and hopefully it's never distracted. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> But you know, with you know having having you know for those who don't know, I have a, a TV with CNBC or Bloomberg on all day, so I can pay attention to what uh, there's trending news and see what's going on, whether it's competitors or industries, and and I think that's very important for any individual of any company is to pay attention to what is happening in, in the media. Um, but that particular example was around probably privacy, and and I saw a headline. And I said, okay, we should probably pay attention to that. I snap it, I go, and then it reminds me to go back, look at the story, and say, how can that inform our team, and then share it back out. Um, so you just it, again, it's it's a bit of multitasking, and most people say not to multitask. <laughs> um, it's a uh, it's it's uh, probably a, a bad habit of mine. But I, but I think in, like, your role, you have to, I mean, I know multitasking is not, like, the best for being super productive, but part of being in comms means you need to be totally aware yeah. of news cycles, things that are trending, which Pretty means even up. though you're doing the work and you're busy doing things, you have to be, like, yeah. unfortunately, you got to be a little bit distracted to, like, keep track of what's happening on Twitter, what's happening on Bloomberg, because that can hit us like that yeah you you by the way you two and you have to tell me what's going on yeah i can't watch twitter all yeah <laughs> I know you guys will um yeah you know and, and an example of that and this is very specific to comms and crisis management um there was an incident within the industry a few years ago and pretty serious one and hadn't heard it and i saw it scroll across um bloomberg and I said, oh, that doesn't look too good. Mm-hmm. And immediately it put us into action because we saw it. And right. so paying attention to what's happening 
uh, will will pay off in terms of how do how do we go to market? What's happening with competitors, and et cetera? And, and Jerry's like the first one, and like Jerry catches stuff before I do. Always. Like he'll get a, he'll get an email about something. I'll be like, how did Jerry see that? How does he know about that already? That's barely <laughs> that's barely been tweeted. Google alert. Yeah. Google alert. <laughs> um, it's also I would I wouldn't uh, prescribe this, but it, there's a little bit of a. A, a workaholic. Mm-hmm. Do, well, I just you, well, know, you my have phone's to. You on have to. And I'm, I'm watching it and find balance. What I would say is find balance in in, in what you do, and and you know I do mm-hmm. find balance, mm-hmm. but in order for us to succeed, it's also paying attention to some of those stories. Can you talk a little bit about um, crisis management and and pulling together a team? Uh, very quickly and kind of just taking the reins Um, because I've seen you in action so many times where something will happen and you will all of a sudden will be on a phone call with 50 other people executives people in all different ranks and you are so polished so good on that call I would think Jerry must have scripted this. You must have like written a script to lead this phone call. Can you talk about a little bit about your like your process for kind of like um, pulling together a quick meeting and being able to like lead a very successful meeting quickly? Well, I've I've, um, I've monitored our leaders and what um, what they expect, and this goes back to what I said a few minutes ago, which is understanding the mindset of whoever, whatever your audience is, and and so whether it's your team of PR and comms professionals or a group of of CEOs and and head of security and legal and compliance and business leaders, and you know you. you you have to understand what are they thinking about and how how do you then kind of prep and take all this information in, into it. And um, I, I think it's a matter of just digesting it and putting it into and digest enough information so they have it and so they can action it or we can action it. Um, I, I don't know, then it's probably a little bit of experience in managing so many issues over the years and, and, and what we can do, but it's, it, it comes down to getting the intelligence and the information and then figuring out how to action it and, and make recommendations. And um, I think as, as, as a leader, uh, I'm expected to, especially on crisis comms, to take in the information and have a take and have a recommendation. By the way, my recommendation may not be the right recommendation out of the gate. Mm-hmm. But it's a recommendation, and then we start making decisions based on all the information and inputs. And um, um, I, don't, I don't want to go into a lot of details, but there was an issue one time where we're sitting around with the, the CEO and, and our CISO and, and the head of legal and business, and, and we discussed it. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily a crisis comms recommendation from me, yeah. but we talked about the information and the CEO just immediately said, okay, here's what we need to do. And he set the tone. Mm-hmm. He set the march. So for, for anybody around that table, yeah. including myself, as you get that information, you get that drink, great. That's a sign of a leader. Mm. And that's what you need. So whether it's me as a leader doing a comm saying or the CEO saying right. this is what's right for the company and we have to do it, and then you go with it. I mean, that's a, that's a good sign of leadership. I like how you said that too about how I think a lot of um, leaders, whether they're making a marketing decision, making a decision on a product, uh, making a decision on an investment, like sometimes you don't have all the data points. No. And like you said, you have to have a take. Yeah. So it's like, okay, this is, I think, the way we need to go, but we're going to course correct. Yeah. Based, based on what you know, it's all the information. Um, you you want to, you know, so step one when you get into a situation like that is gather the facts and make sure you have the facts and then understand what the perceptions or misperceptions are out there and how you balance it with the facts and then and then figuring out what to do and then thinking about you know the 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 stakeholders external stakeholders who are impacted by that like so so if i have a business leader 
they may say, well, listen, my, my clients in this category are going to take it this way, so we need to think about how to communicate there. Consumers may be impacted this way. Regulators may have a particular uh, perspective that we have to address as well. What does it mean overseas? And so because it's in today's uh, news cycle, even if a, an issue emanates from the U.S., it will certainly go overseas quickly. Like there's no there's no longer kind of a regional fo regionally focused issue. Most issues, big issues, are going to cross the borders, and then you got to start making sure that we are connected with our colleagues as well. <laughs> Did you always want to be a leader? Yes. So um, I was uh, my 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 father was a colonel in the Marine Corps. So I was raised with, along with my brother, uh, Colonel Shop would, uh, <laughs> would, would wake us up. AKA Dad. <laughs> uh, boys, get in the garage, 0600. Oh my God. Like he would have this commanding presence wow. and, and you know, we're, my brother and I'm 12 years old. He's like, you got to sweep here. And, and it, I'm worried with all that stuff. But, what I saw and what I watched and it's like, all right, boy, and we got stuff done. It's like, he was probably the, Mike, to your point earlier, he might have been the guy that was <laughs> Colonel Shop was a little intense, but in a good way. Yeah. But what I, what I learned from that is like, all right, how do I, how do I kind of use that? And then as I got into college, uh, I had a, a professor, Jack Heger, who was amazing and a great men, uh, mentor to me. and. He said, he said, look, if you, if you want to really follow it, this PR profession and you want to be a leader, you should start getting involved in organizations. So I immediately joined uh, a, a group at the time, Public Relations Student Society of America. Mm -hmm. And you know, my first year I became a treasurer and then I, was a, I became president of the organization. And, and I realized like, oh, this is really good. That's kind of where I got my feet wet to do it. And then, and then, of course, Carl Schaaf said, it's about time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but so, so you, you feel good about it. But right. like, yeah, am I a leader? Sure. I'm a follower, too. I mean, just mm -hmm. like you, you, can, you can be a leader of something, and it doesn't mean that it's all you. Yeah. Because if I'm not also uh, collaborating and working with others, you, you, won't, you won't be successful. So I think one of the tenets of being a good leader is also to be a good collaborator and right. a, good, a good teammate. Um, I think we have a lot of individual contributors who still don't know if they want to be a leader or be in a leadership position or manage people in the yeah. future. So can you kind of speak on what leadership looks like in your role, like being C-suite? Um, were there any sacrifices you had to make? How does a day look like? How tired are you? <laughs> uh, I, I would... Uh, <laughs> I won't whine about it. Uh, but, look, I, you... Um, you, you I, I feel like I'm on... It, it's interesting. So, um, Craig Boundy is... He, he's a big believer in finding balance and in, in management, right. even though he's got huge responsibilities, he says, "Like I'm still going to go out and, and coach my kids or or, mm -hmm. or be active." And I, we kind of follow that philosophy um, and, and say we, we find balance regardless. Um, so, you know, do you, do you give up a little something? Nah, I don't know. It's 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 all everybody's giving up something. Yeah. Right. It doesn't matter whether you're a leader. Every everybody, I believe has the same kind of work motivation and wanting to succeed. Um, but I've, you know, I have, I have a very structured routine to, to manage both North America and then global interests as well. Um, and, and that's making sure I stay close uh, with the regional, uh, regional leaders or regional comms leaders and understanding what's happening out there and then getting up first thing in the morning and paying attention to either emails overnight and and seeing what's hit or seeing my Google alerts or news feeds uh, of what's happening to see if we, how the day's going to shake out. I think um, being very organized in terms of what to, what needs to get done and goes back to lists and, mm -hmm. and, and um, 
making sure we're hitting deadlines and 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 also trying to be very respectful of of uh, meeting times and whether you start on time and be respectful of everybody who's going to be on and and ending at an appropriate time. I'm not perfect at that by any means, but I try and look at the the clock and say, hey, we got 10 minutes left. All right, what do we need to do? And any more questions on this? And how do we want to close it up? Yeah, because we. We sometimes fall in a culture where it's okay to be five minutes late to a meeting or mm-hmm. and five minutes late. And um, like I said, I'm not I'm not preaching perfection here, but I do believe we can all benefit from doing more. Today. Have you ever dealt with burnout either here at Experian or at any other company you've been at? <sighs> sure, ten minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I I I, I haven't. Um, but I, I haven't, uh, but I also work hard to recharge at the right time. Um, what does that look it, like to you, recharging? Um, it can be playing, playing basketball. It could be going for a bike ride on the beach with uh, my kids. It could be going out to the lake to go water skiing. Um, it could be a great dinner with my wife and, and mm. friends and sharing a good bottle of wine and a great meal and some laughs. And, it, you know, mm-hmm. it's... it's it's getting, it's putting the work down, yeah, right. and it's going and experiencing life, and having emotions and and um, pleasures that don't involve work, because then, you know, and going back to the mantra, of bringing your whole self to work. I want to then say, all right, how did how did that weekend or how did how did my activities influence it? Yeah, and I think the more you do that. The, the better you are about uh, coming up with new ideas or solutions or managing and getting the energy because it takes it takes a lot of energy to uh, in, in any leadership position or any position for that matter. And so make sure you, you, you focus on, on yourself and your family as well as uh, work. You know, as, I've, as I, as I um, was in this recent uh, Power Your Potential program, as I was chatting with different people, they were talking about how a lot of people want to improve their public speaking skills. Yeah. And when I look at you and, and you as a communicator, you've done a, just a fantastic job. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you have improved your presentation skills, your speaking skills over the years. Yeah, I, uh, I can continue to use improvement. I mean, just a, I, you, I, no matter what your level is, if you ask, any, mm-hmm. any senior leader, everybody's going to have a little bit of attention going into it, and that's good. And you have to kind of harness that and, and use it as energy to, to, to resolve it. Um, the, I, I use every opportunity, whether I'm speaking to two people, 20 people, 50 people, as a chance to hone in on whatever the message is and... and and also, eye con- I, I just believe eye contact matters. If you're just kind of looking down the whole time, it, you're, you're never going to engage anybody. But if I make a point with eye contact, mm-hmm. you like, or you, Patty, and I'm going, and I, I just think that's important. But, you know, I, there, there's still a lot of work to do. That's, that's interesting. I was just listening to a podcast with Brene Brown, and she's, like, known for doing one of the best TED Talk presentations, and she recently did a Netflix Netflix special, and she talked about how um, she told the directors at Netflix that she wanted the house lights up. Yeah. She didn't want spotlight on her because she wanted to see and connect with the eyes hmm. and the audience, and then she, she said for her that was really important to connect with people yeah. at the eye level. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that's why, well... I, I think that's an important point because if I'm also looking out at the audience and if I look over at Patty and she's kind of looking down or looking disinterested, oof, that's a, <laughs> yeah. I, I will immediately leave that because right. I can read down. So I, I, I also think it's a reminder in the, when you're in the audience, be, be present and, and make try and make eye contact with them. It's like, oh, all right, good. And and um, I think you get more out of it as well. Yeah. But I, I, I do believe, like, get, have, have an energy with your audience. Um, we, we, I, I had to uh, present to a group of 
few months ago, and it was like I don't know, 25 or 30 people. It was a Friday afternoon at like 2:30, and oh, yeah, that's it, a hard it, time. It it it. it it was horrible. It was horrible. Like, I, I was watching them. They're like, "Why? Why are we here?" <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, "How am I going to get them? Yeah. And engage them and get them going?" And um, you know, try and use a little humor and get them going. But generally, I could tell like Friday afternoon is not the place to, to get people's energy up. But and you have to. Again, I'm going to go back to understanding the audience's mindset. Where's where's their head? Well, on Friday afternoon, I knew where their head was. It was like, <laughs> I'm going bike riding the next day. I'm going dinner tonight. Okay. It wasn't on learning about what's going on, communications <laughs> and all this and that. Absolutely not. Uh, so, so then you, you try and uh, switch the script a little bit to, to make it relatable to them. Mm. And so that's, that, I think, is important. What has been the most humbling experience of your career so far? Hmm. I've had quite a few, and I think the the, the lessons along the way are you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna either fail, you're gonna misstep, uh, and and it's just gonna happen. If you yeah. think you're gonna yep. have a perfect, right. uh, uh, hundred uh, percent perfect career, you're, you're fooling yourself, and. It's okay, and um, you know I've, I've had a, a few. Um, there's 20 years ago or so, I had a boss, and, and I made a decision on a. I think I made a decision on doing a press release or something, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is the right thing to do. I probably don't need to check in with that person, and we did it. Uh, and uh, I got a call from that person at my house that evening. Oh, I got geez. I got ripped, and and uh, there, we we didn't do much harm. There was no harm in what was done. Yeah. But the lesson learned for me was, you know, it just I don't have to feel like I have to make all these decisions all the time, and and it, it, so it was it was a little bit humbling. I didn't like the person's approach, <laughs> um, you know. And then there's uh, a few years back, I, did, I, uh, I had a good year, but I didn't have a great year, and and I got some very candid feedback and criticism on on my performance or what I could do better and boy you know I strive for perfection and that was like oh all right great but but when I took it in it made me better and smarter and I adjusted to it and then I had a great year and so you just you you know you you should be humble enough to take the criticism right and then figure out how can how can you make it better and that's why sometimes when we get um, we're, many are afraid to provide the criticism to people because of sensitivities mm-hmm. or emotions or whatever it is um, I, I try and look at it as when, I, when I'm giving providing feedback or criticism it's not a personal criticism it's how how do we do this better together and, and um, it's not because I don't like your personality. It's not because of mm-hmm. the way you are. This is, all right, here's, here's my input, and this is how we, we're going to get better together. And, and I need to, I, I apply that same. So even though I've been humbled many times in my career in terms of, of doing things better, or how I can do it better, um, but hopefully because of that, I'm good at do better. I hope not to fail much moving forward, but there's a good chance something will happen. I think that's the hard part um, when you get constructive criticism, not to take it personally. That's the hard thing. Because it's about you. Because it's about you (laughs) and the way you're doing things, and maybe you thought you were doing things the right way, and all of a sudden someone you respect comes and tells you something that all of a sudden puts the brakes on, you're like, oh my gosh, I've been doing it wrong? Or I could do a lot better. Like that. That's the hard part. And actually, uh, Patty and I were talking about um, last Friday about feedback. Yep. <laughs> so do you want to share like the different perspectives on feedback? Because we were discussing like different ways of 
how what sort of feedback is actually valuable. I love that you're asking me to explain this when you know how confused I am about <laughs> feedback. I mean, we, were, we were both chatting about it. I'd love to hear your perspective on it. So go ahead. Um, yeah. So we're reading a book and it's about the nine lies about leadership mm. and just the workplace in general. And one of the lies was that people need feedback and they're arguing that people don't need feedback, at least not feedback the way that we've mm. like popularized it in the workplace. So um, candid feedback, 360 feedback, all like the different types. So we were saying that it's kind of confusing because sometimes you want to be able to take feedback from whoever, whether it's your peers or you yeah. like worked with them maybe once or were in a meeting with them once. But then it's like, does that person know me well enough to give me good, honest feedback? But then there's also the argument that, well, you should take feedback from everyone because that's how they perceive you and you should be taking into account the perception of what you're putting out there. So it's just like, wait, what? Yeah. what and, then, and, then, and then Alpha's comment. <laughs> right. Yeah. She was just like, you shouldn't trust all the feedback that you're given because yeah. not everybody knows you well. Mm-hmm. Like not everyone knows your intent and what you're trying to do. So it's just like <laughs> I agree with I agree with Alpha. <laughs> and I got an analogy for you when when my wife and I uh, if we're traveling or we're going into a different city and we're in a, a cab or an Uber right. and we say, hey, what do you think about this restaurant? Or what, what's the best restaurant in town? Yeah. And and they may recommend something. And then and then my wife will be like, wait, why, why are we, what, are, what, are, what are his or her credentials to right. recommend That's such a good example. And, and so, so you really do have to think about why, where are you getting that feedback? Like, and... And it also goes to something that I, I learned um, from one of my bosses probably 15, 20 years ago. And, and she, she said, hey, Jerry, uh, being liked is not the same as being respected. Mm-hmm. And so that one person who gives you feedback, you may be curious because you want them to like mm-hmm. how you right, manage. Right, right. But in aggregate, how you are how you're perceived either by your uh, peers or bosses and that sort of thing is about are they respecting the way you work so you know how do you how do you get the respect out of there mm. i think i totally went off on a tangent no that the, i think that but, but the, yeah. you know going on the analogy of you know who do you trust for feedback well i i want to get it so that i can earn respect right so i can be a good counselor Sure, I like to be liked. Everybody wants to be liked. But that's not that's not going to make the difference in performance necessarily. I may get more out of uh, people that way, yeah. but ultimately, you want to be, I think, respected. Because if I'm giving you guys feedback, aren't you going to take it more if you respect my opinion mm-hmm. on it? Yeah. If if you like me, you may be like. Hey Jerry, that is a, that's a nice guy, but I don't know what the hell he's talking about on the social media right. stuff. I think that's a really good distinction, actually, because yeah, I was telling Mike, I'm like so confused about where I should be taking my feedback from and what kind of feedback I want. But yeah, I think not being able to take it personally also goes back to oh I want this person to like me so if they're giving me negative feedback then they don't like me and I'm gonna take it personally so I think that's a good thing to take into account is that you know do people like you or do they respect you yeah yeah and, and if you don't like their feedback, just ignore them <laughs> just ignore them, <laughs> just ignore them. No, bye just <laughs> um, so Gary I know we're coming to an end but um I'm kind of curious about some of the people or training or things that have made some of the biggest impact on your leadership style. You mentioned your dad. Colonel yeah. Shaw. Yeah, Colonel. <laughs> Colonel, Colonel I, I could go on personal levels and family and, you know, my, so my dad, my mom, um, I, I do think my my wife as a partner <clears throat> is great about kind of grounding me and saying, well, did, if I explained her situation, she's pretty good and she comes from a PR background, so that's helpful. Mm. Uh, but but she's got a good sense of humanity to where <clears throat> she's like, well, did you think about that? So that's mm. like personal stuff. That's good. Um, that's really good. It, so don't don't ignore the people that you, you trust around right. you to to influence it. Um, I I don't, I don't know if I've ever had the perfect leader to say that is my true north of how yeah. I want to go, but I, I can take enough from 
various leaders over time um, and philosophies. Um, and um, I think that matters. And then, I, again, the team around me and, and watching how they react to stuff, that, that influences my, my leadership style as well. Um, yeah. I have one more question, and it's around humor. So I think you do a really good job of diffusing <clears throat> tense situations <laughs> with humor. Uh, we can be in a crisis mode working all weekend long, and we're in meetings, and Jerry will just have, like, we'll say something that is going to break, you know, break the silence, break the, the tense situation, make it funny. Uh, talk, talk, can you talk a little about your, your uh, you, I mean, you always make me laugh, but like your, your, your presence. Is that a like, forced laugh, though? Because <laughs> he's my boss. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's obligatory. But like, I mean, I think, and actually in that, uh, there's this book that I have that Claudette recommended that has like 200 leadership skills. One of them was humor. And it talks about like people that overdo it with humor, right? Mm -hmm. And like disrupt a meeting and like take things off course. But then there's like the proper use of humor to like diffuse tense situations, make things easier. Yeah. Um, so I hope, hopefully I strive a balance on it. Um, and because it, if I think we all enjoy a, a laugh once in a while, or we, we have to infuse a little bit of levity in, yeah. in what we're doing not all the time, but. Um, and and we could have some tense moments sometimes. So humor humor can be a part of it. I don't know whether I'm funny or not, but it's enough to force people to laugh and, <laughs> and, and go with it. Um, then I'm trying to follow my my train of thought, but it's humor like I can be serious all day. I think everybody wants to enjoy a laugh. Um, you you want. Um, I, I do see it, this again gets back to the meeting. If I see people's faces yeah. really tense, right. they're not gonna do their best. So, all right, let's 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 lighten it up a little bit. Um, you know, I, it's interesting, not, not every, not every leader believes in the power of humor. I had a um, very senior leader here who has since left at one point said, hey, Jerry, you should use less humor. Mm -hmm. You should use, nobody, nah, not every, nobody likes, the, not everybody <laughs> likes the humor. I said, what, really? And I, I trusted that person yeah. at the time. I trusted them. That and feedback, now, yeah. <laughs> we, went, we went, the feedback. <laughs> we, we, went, we went into this um, round table discussion and and uh, I was, it was a panel, and I was asked a question, and, and I was like, oh, this would be perfect. I could <laughs> nail this one-liner. And I'm like, all right, so I went with the straight answer. The next person answered with a little bit of humor and a joke and got some chuckles. And uh, a particular senior leader after that said, oh, I'm glad you guys used some humor in that. That 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 is so, like, oh, no. <laughs> so what it goes back to who are you taking feedback yep. from? <laughs> and I, ever this was uh, just three to five years ago. And I, ever since then I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna follow my own path on that. And once in a while use humor or not. Um, but look, we we all we're all humans. We're all we're not robots, not quite yet. We're, we're, we're leaning toward yeah. AI and such. But um, like we're all we're all humans, and and we, we have to be able to interact and and appeal to our emotions and, and appeal to motivations and respect right. re respect each other's uh, work lives and personal lives and um, you know if I if I. If I can have a team where we feel pretty good about working together and, and, you, and you walk away um, uh, respecting one another, I think we're going to do better things together. Mm -hmm. and, and it's when we don't treat each other as humans that that becomes quite disrespectful. And I don't think anybody wants to work in an environment like that. And that's why one of the things I love about the culture that's being driven here at Experian is that we're 
we, we try and create that sense mm -hmm. of humanity and, and approachability. I think that's an amazing note to end off on. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for giving us your time today, Jerry. Um, for everyone listening, our next guest will be Justin Hastings, Chief Human Resources Officer, July 16 at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and Reshma Peck on July 23rd at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. She's the SVP of Marketing. Please let us know what you found helpful in this series and what topics or leaders you'd like featured, and reach out on lead at Experian.com. That's L-E-A-D at Experian.com. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Patty. Thank Thanks, you. Jerry. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.